All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, we'd like to welcome you to our second annual School Safety and Security Forum. Um, I'm your host, Michael Lawrence, Communication Officer for Seminole County Public Schools. I'm going to be your moderator this evening. Um, before we begin, just a few house housekeeping items. Um, bathrooms are located in the lobby outside, men's on this side, women's on that side. Um, and like in the movie theaters, a friendly reminder to please silence your cell phones, all right? Um, I'd like to recognize a few distinguished guests we have in our audience tonight. We have School Board Vice Chair Dr. Tina Calderon. <laughs> School Board Member Karen Allman. School Board Member Abby Sanchez. Also, several of our municipality police chiefs, Chief Dan Smuts, Altamont Springs PD. Chief Dale Coleman, Oviedo PD. Chief Steve Bracknell, Lake Mary PD. Chief Larry Krantz, Castleberry PD. Chief Kevin Burnell, Winter Springs PD. Special Agent Kevin Kaufman with the FBI. Um, Barb Bergen our, with Crimeline. As well as our leadership teams from both Seminole County Sheriff's Office and Seminole County Public Schools. Also, if there's any other elected officials present, please stand to be recognized. All right. Well, thank you all for your service and leadership. At this time, I'd like to introduce our illustrious panel with us tonight. We have U.S. Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy, Florida Representative Scott Plakin, Seminole County Sheriff Dennis Lima. Um, we have Superintendent Dr. Walt Griffin, School Board Chair Amy Lockhart, and our School Safety and Security Director, Captain Rick Francis. We greatly appreciate all of you being here tonight. We know that school safety is a priority for us all, and we all agree that our schools should be safe environments for our children. Within a two-week period, we received more than 500 questions and topics from parents across the district. Since we only have an hour this evening, however, we selected around 10 of the most frequently asked questions for our panel to field tonight. While we're not able to answer every question that was submitted this evening, we do plan to create an FAQ responding to many of the other questions we received and we'll email blast those out to all our families and post on our district website once complete. All right, let's get started. We're gonna begin with some opening comments from US Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy, followed by State Representative Scott Plankin. Thank you. Um, I'm so pleased to be here with my fellow panelists um, and with all of the elected officials and all of you. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy and I represent Seminole County and parts of Orange County in Congress and I've been doing so since about January of 2017. In addition to being a member of Congress, I'm also the mom of two small children, a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. Um, so I'm really inspired to see what a terrific turnout we have here tonight with parents and students and members of our community who are concerned um, and want to ensure that we have safe schools. I'm also really inspired by the young people in Florida and across the country who have decided enough is enough and that they're making their voices heard. You know, I think as mothers and fathers, um, there's nothing that we wouldn't do to keep our kids safe. And whether your kid is in second grade or a senior in high school, when you say goodbye to them every morning and send them off to school, you want them to be focused on learning, uh, focused on the activities they've chosen to do, focused on their friends. Um, the last thing is for, that you want for them is for them to be worried about their personal safety and about violence and about the possibility of being shot by a disturbed person with a deadly weapon, whether that person's a classmate or an intruder on campus. But as Sandy Hook and Parkland and other tragic incidents have shown all too clearly, we live in a complex and dangerous world, and our children are not immune from these dangers. Um, I believe that schools should serve as a sanctuary, but that's not been the case in, in some of these communities. 
Since Columbine in 1999, more than 1,800, uh, well, sorry, 187,000 students attending nearly 200 K-12 schools have experienced a shooting on campus during school hours. That's roughly the population of Fort Lauderdale. And while school shootings are relatively rare, the ones that do occur are deeply traumatic and have spread fear, um, changing the culture of education and simply how our kids get to grow up. For example, many schools conduct active shooter drills where children as young as four hide in darkened closets and bathrooms from imaginary murderers. And I am open to sharing that my son when he was five was in an active shooter um, situation at his school and spent three hours with a bunch of five-year-olds uh, in a closet. So this is deeply personal for me. I'm really encouraged that we're here to talk about the concrete steps that we, as responsible adults, um, can take to keep our kids safe without turning our schools into fortresses or prisons that aren't conducive to learning. I wanted to make just three kind of broad statements of principle to help frame the discussion. You know, first, the fact that you're here tonight shows that you reject the notion that gun violence, whether it takes place on our streets or in our schools, is somehow inevitable. We cannot shield our sons and daughters from all the risks, of course, but we can take smart and thoughtful actions to substantially reduce that risk. Put another way, we're powerful, not powerless. We're passionate, not passive, and we're committed, not cynical. Second, I think this is a battle that has to be waged on all fronts. It has to be fought at the federal, state, and local levels. It has to be fought by government officials, by law enforcement officers, and mental health experts, by concerned citizens, and by our youth who have shown such leadership after Parkland, leading the March for Our Lives protests around the country and making clear that they expect action for those, from those people who have positions of power. And third and finally, I don't believe that this is a Republican or a Democratic issue. This isn't about a red party or a blue party. To the contrary, I believe it's about the red, white, and blue. It's about the country we all love. It's about working together to make it safer and stronger. As the federal official on the panel, I'm happy to talk about what we're doing at the federal level or what we're not doing in Washington to reduce gun violence and increase school safety while respecting the Second Amendment. Um, but, uh, and I'm happy to dive into some of those details in the Q&A, but I want you to know that you have my word that I'll never stop fighting to keep our children, our communities, and our country safe. So thank you again, and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Representative Plakin. Thank you. Uh, my name is Scott Plakin. I have the honor of representing District 29 in the Florida House of Representatives uh, in the State House, Tallahassee. Uh, I'm also a father of six that all of my kids, uh, they're grown now, but have been in Seminole County schools. And what has helped shape my thinking on this is in 2014, my daughter Jeannie was at Lake Mary High School. Some of you may remember uh, it was believed that there was an active shooter that was there. Uh, I have, I read on the House floor in the passage of Reese's legislation, uh, the text messages from my daughter Jeannie, and I, I didn't bring them tonight, but it's, Daddy, I'm so scared. Uh, there's a shooter in the cafeteria. The police are on the way here. I can't stop crying. And I have those text messages, and that's a reminder to me of the importance of this. Uh, thankfully, at Lake Mary, and, and I was one of those parents for uh, 23 minutes it took me to get there from Deltona. I think I broke every traffic law to get there, and I showed up at the scene that no parent wants to see. There's helicopters overhead, dozens of emergency vehicles, and the, uh, starting with Columbine, the parents' faces pressed against the chain link fence, trying to get any information they can. So that was in 2014. Uh, fast forward to this past year, uh, uh, Representative uh, Moskowitz, who was the vice mayor of Parkland, who graduated from that school, uh, got up and at a point of order and found out that there was a shooting and uh, we had a moment of silence. Little did we know when we had that moment of silence on the House floor what was to, to what would lie ahead. Uh, we passed a bill that was bipartisan in nature. Uh, both Democrats and Republicans, some voted for, some against. I think there was about 20 Republicans voted against it. Uh, we're about two to one Republican and Democrat, 20 voted against it and 10 Democrats voted against it. And likewise, it was perhaps the most unique example of bipartisanship that I've ever seen in the Florida House. And as a person that voted for it, 
I was very, very proud to vote for it because my thinking in that is, first of all, we have to respect the Second Amendment, but I can't think of a higher responsibility that we have than to keep our children safe. There was a, uh, the, a week, week, maybe two weeks before the vote, I had a meeting in my office, and there's, I think, about 60 people came, and we heard a lot of different sides, a lot of different uh, viewpoints on this, but the one I remember most is a young lady named Jenna. Uh, I think she's 15 at Lake Mary High School, and she just looked at me and, and very sharp uh, on the debate team, blue key, and, and just said, you know, we're scared. So in going into the debate on all this, I, I remember that, how, how can this be in the United States of America that children can go to school shared? One thing we used as a template, uh, there was a lot of voices, there was thousands of people showed up. Uh, lot, I think most of the families were there during session at one point. But when I heard that all 17 families, Democrat, Republican, Buddhist, Christian, Jewish, every one of them, supported the legislation that we had. Uh, that was a motivating factor for me. There was a lot of different voices, and there, let, let's face it, the firearm issue is probably not gonna get settled right now. So Andy Pollack and Ryan Petty were in the gallery during the vote, and I remember Andy Pollack, uh, the, the, the Meadow was lost, said, what can we do now to keep schools safe? And in the Florida legislature, um, after taking all this input, we had three weeks to put it together. I'm very proud of what we did. We have $400 million worth of school hardening, uh, uh, enhanced money for SROs. We formed the Aaron Feist uh, Guardian Program uh, and many other elements. There's mental health improvements. And we used as a template what happened there in the time that we had and tried to sort of, you know, look at the events that happened and what could we do now to take the first step. And again, for us, this is the first step, and I'll perhaps talk more about it later on maybe future things or what we might do. So thank you, and it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Representative. All right, all right. now it's time to dive into all the questions that we received from you, our, our, our parents. Um, the first question is gonna go to Sheriff Lima. Um, the first question is, the Seminole County plan to arm teachers? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. That's a lot louder than I thought it would be. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna hold it way, way lower. But uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to come out and share with you tonight. You know, when we look at what we're doing for school safety and security here in Seminole County, I would think that we have the test model or the model that other organizations across our country are trying to emulate now. We have a wonderful relationship here at the Sheriff's Office with our superintendent, our school board members, and all uh, seven municipal uh, police chiefs and police departments. We're proud to say that uh, Seminole County is, is one of the only districts, I, I think maybe the only district, that had already had a dedicated law enforcement officer on every single public school campus in Seminole County years before this ever became a topic of conversation. And although there is a lot of talk about different strategies to way to protect the campus, we feel, myself, the chiefs of police, and our superintendent feel that the police work in arming of people should be left to the fully trained professional law enforcement officers on campus. Maybe I should just sit down now, so. <laughs> yeah, I got the good question. But there's reasons why. It's more than just being armed uh, that provides safety and security. Our deputy sheriffs that are on campus are properly equipped, they're properly trained, and they have a passion to serve with kids in that particular capacity. When there was a time when we had the D.A.R.E. program and D.A.R.E.s were in, in, in elementary schools across our country, we realized that saying no to drugs was simply not enough in today's day and age, and we had to create a curriculum that was relevant to some of the challenges that we face today. The sexting, the texting, the cyberbullying, and a whole host of things that we are seeing now that we did not see 20 years ago. 
So what we did was we created a curriculum for fifth graders, focus on safety that we were able to adopt and modify from the Citrus County Sheriff's Office, and it's taught in every one of our fifth grade classes across our district. That is what we've done. We have these deputies and police officers on campus, and that is only occurring because of the partnership that we have with our school board. A 50-50 financial split, and we are lockstep in all that we do. After this most recent shooting in South Florida, before any decisions out of Tallahassee occurred, we made the decision to put two law enforcement officers on every high school campus permanently in Seminole County. But it doesn't stop there. Years ago, the superintendent and we at the sheriff's office made an agreement that when the school safety and security director was retiring out, we replaced that position with a dedicated captain of the sheriff's office that oversees school safety and security for the entire district and quite literally works in the superintendent's office. And they are together all of the time. And you'll hear a lot from Captain Rick Francis, who is, is I feel, the best in the business at what he does, honestly. Yeah. And then it doesn't stop there. We'll talk a little bit more about this later, but we have technology, the Rave Panic app that is available to teachers and faculty. We are the test site for all that, that stuff that's going on. I mean, it is unbelievable when you hear in greater detail, but to answer, I think I'm over my three minutes, but <laughs> we, we are not arming school teachers or other school faculty members. We're gonna leave that to law enforcement officers and we may use some additional funds that come into Seminole County to have pay, paid reserve programs that are already dedicated law enforcement officers that are fully trained, fully equipped, and fully certified to go out there and patrol the streets and use them in that capacity. Thank you, Sheriff. Our next question is for Superintendent Walt Griffin. What are we doing to keep our kids safe? Thank you, Michael. Good evening, everybody. Sheriff covered most of my answer, just for the record. <laughs> I want to, um, first of all, begin by telling you that school safety to us is not something that we overreact to. The day after the tragedy in South Florida, the most, the most common question we got in our emails were flooded and phone calls were coming in. What are you going to do now? And we personally contacted everybody who reached out to us to say, it's not what we're going to do now, it's what we've been doing for five years. And first thing I want you to know, in fact, I'm going to ask our school board members to stand up, Ms. Amon, Dr. Calderon, Ms. Sanchez, and Amy Alcorn, stand up just for a second. I want to tell you all something. I have, in the, as my sixth year as superintendent, I have brought $25 million in safety requests to this board. They have never, ever said no. Thank you. <laughs> Those safety requests were to pay for the SROs in every school. Other districts are asking, how do you pay for the SROs in every school? The sheriff's department and the local agencies pay half the salaries. This is a community effort. I am not a trained law enforcement specialist. That's why Captain Francis is in my office. That's why I talk to the sheriff all the time. When we have dollars to spend on safety, like we just recently received, I am not going to sit in my office in isolation, or even with my wonderful team, who were, were all educators, where do I go? I go to the sheriff, I go to the experts to give us advice on hardening our campuses, hiring the right people, do the things that we need to do to make sure that all 67,500 students feel safe every single day. It's important. I'll also tell you, we, we've been bombarded with a questions about arming teachers. And you heard the sheriff's response, and I want you to hear it from me. I truly believe that that is the work of law enforcement. I'm a longtime teacher. There is, I'm a longtime teacher. I worked at schools a lot longer. I worked in the county office, and I can tell you there is no more distracting job than teaching. I taught secondary. Go into a kindergarten teacher's room and just 
look at what they have to deal with every day. I'd be afraid of losing one of them. And the thought of us putting a weapon in their hands while they're trying to do all that in probably the most distracting job in America I know could create additional problems. So this is, this is all about our relationship as superintendent. This is nothing new. For six years, my message has been simple. We have three priorities in Seminole County. Number one, not new this year, since the beginning, safety. Number two, relationships, which I'll talk about when we get to mental health, and then we worry about achievement, because without the first two, you have nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Griffin. Our next question is for Captain Francis. How often are Code Red drills completed, and will they increase to monthly? It's always great going behind two great leaders and speakers. <laughs> I got the short stick, that's for sure. Um, Obviously, we are going to see some changes in legislation. We're already starting to see it. Uh, obviously, um, we in Simmel County have been leading the charge on a lot of things when it comes to school safety. Uh, like the superintendent mentioned, none of this is a knee-jerk reaction. We've been doing it. And it's, it's not us sitting up there in Ivory Tower. There's boots on the ground. You see officers and deputies here. Our collaboration with our local cities, the school system, and, of course, uh, uh, our federal partners. We have historically done red, code red drills in our schools twice a year. Those will continue. Um, we're looking at some legislation that's going to change that to probably a quarterly basis, and we'll continue to um, push those out to and make sure that we're prepared for that worst case scenario. Um, I get have tons of conversations about what we do, and it's important. We set minimums. Um, but the schools themselves also can take on and practice with their safe teams and stuff like that, all these safety procedures that we have in place. We do believe that we are years ahead of most districts, but our work is not done. We've learned lessons. We've learned lessons from prior incidents. For whatever reason, uh, these, this incident has uh, fueled uh, some attention, like Superintendent and the Sheriff mentioned. We've been doing this for years. We've been locking classrooms. We've been doing all this stuff, and we'll continue to do it, and we'll continue to learn, um, not only from tragic incidents, but it tra uh, incidents that have been averted, which is even more important for us. Um, how do we continue to stay a step ahead of things? So we will continue with the drills. Um, you'll probably see um, or hear about these expanding to uh, maybe a quarterly or, or even more frequency. Um, it's going to continue to ensure, and I get calls every time, especially when it comes to unannounced drills. You're traumatizing our kids. Why are you doing this? And I am doing this, or we are doing this, to keep them safe. And it's real important to understand that most of these drills are meant to teach our faculty and ensure our process is, is smooth. And we believe that our kids will follow, and we have to treat a high school level differently from an elementary level. And that's how we uh, approach this as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Our next question is going to be for Congresswoman Murphy, and that is, what is being done at the federal level to financially support school safety in Seminole County? So if I had to summarize what uh, we're doing in Washington to decrease gun violence and increase school safety, I would say that we've made a few modest steps, but there's so much more that can be done. Um, I'm going to outline three of the things that just passed uh, last Friday in the omnibus. Uh, the first one is what's called the Stop School Violence Act. Um, it provides funding uh, in grant form for state and uh, local governments to be able to allow schools to implement um, uh, various process training and technology that would um, identify basically training for uh, teachers, law enforcement, administrators to be able to identify the threat before that person um, actually is, who somebody who's motivated to violence, be able to disrupt their behavior and prevent the incident from happening. Um, there's some money in there for some technologies, uh, much as what uh, has been mentioned already. It would be technologies either to uh, quickly alert local law enforcement that there's an incident on the campus. There's money for um, hardening school campuses. Um, it'll be about $75 million this year, $100 million for the next nine um, each year. The way that the grant will be um, uh, 
I guess, uh, used or um, implemented would be that uh, you have to apply to the Department of Justice, not the Department of Education, and they will, by a competitive process, try to distribute these grants to communities all across this country. And so what I would encourage Seminole County um, government officials as well as Orange County government officials is as you look to seeking some of these grants to get the funds you need to implement um, school safety measures, that you reach out to our office and let us help you um, work with the Bureau bureaucracy. The second thing that was passed was what's called Fix NICS. And NICS is the national, um, let's see, national instant criminal background check system. And it basically is a measure to prevent people who are never supposed to have a gun in the first place from getting one. And so um, NICS has had some issues because it's a state, federal, and local level um, database, and there have been some reporting issues. So this legislation really seeks to close those issues so that our database is actually functioning the way that it should, and so that we can um, make sure that people uh, don't, um, don't actually purchase the guns when they're not supposed to. And then the final one um, is something that I'm particularly proud of. It um, is something that I have been working on since I got to Congress last year. I um, introduced a bill called the Gun, Gun Violence Research Act. So for the last 22 years, there hasn't been any uh, federal dollars allocated uh, to researching gun violence, despite the fact that it is uh, a public health crisis. Um, and so we worked really hard to get that um, bill uh, a lot of support. But until Parkland happened, we weren't able to make it a bipartisan bill. It was, uh, we didn't have a single Republican who wanted the facts on, on gun violence research. But after Parkland, and I have to give the credit to the students, after they raised their voices and they spoke out and they demanded action from their elected leaders, that bill became a bipartisan bill. Republicans began to sign on to it. And I had an opportunity to talk to the president about this bill um, when we were he had that gun violence roundtable. And when we got into negotiating the big funding bill that we did, um, this was one of those things that got fixed. So I'm proud to say that last Friday, the ban on gun violence research was effectively lifted. I think that we can have whatever position we want or ideas about how to address this issue. And, you know, people come at it from pretty rhetorical and polarized positions, but I think at a minimum we should agree that we should all have the facts. And so, um, as I mentioned when I opened up that, you know, there's been some moderate steps in the right direction, but there's a lot more that can be done. I think um, actually there's, there's CDC funding dollars that could be used for this research, but I think the next step for us is to find a specific line item appropriation to ensure that this research does get done. Um, I think, you know, we will be, there are a number of other bills that are currently out there um, at the federal level, but those are the three that have been passed into law, and I hope that this community will begin to see the impacts of those uh, resources and uh, legislation. Thank, Thank you, you, Congresswoman. Our next question is for Sheriff Lehman. We've kind of already tackled this, so it's probably going to be a pretty quick and easy answer, but does the Sheriff's Office and SCPS plan to increase school resource officers and deputies in the schools, for instance, middle and high schools? Yeah, you know, I, I answered that in the beginning, that we have done it already. Uh, our plan is to sustain it, and what we're also doing is ensuring that the law enforcement officers on the campus have the ability to be there 100% of the time. There's one thing to have somebody assigned there, it's another thing to ensure that there's an adequate staffing to ensure that they are there 100% of the time. And that is our effort to ensure that we have uh, deputy sheriffs and police officers that can help with transporting back and forth. And this isn't something that we do uh, alone. You know, we, we've worked very closely with our state representatives, uh, Representative Plakin, uh, Bob Cortez, uh, Jason Broder, and they've kept us in lockstep as far as what do you need for us to advocate for in Tallahassee to make sure that we are protecting our most valuable resource, and that is our children. One other thing is, is in addition to school resource deputies, there's a lot that occurs behind the scene that we don't talk about that much. 
We feel that crime and delinquency and patterns of bizarre behavior are symptoms of other problems. And the Sheriff's Office has units that are dedicated to address those underlying conditions that lead to delinquent and criminal acts. So we have a domestic security division, we have uh, a mental health awareness group, and I know the superintendent's gonna talk more about that, but there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes as well that Captain Francis has direct access to as he works to develop long-term and sustainable solutions to address uh, any concerns in our, in our uh, schools. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, Dr. Griffin, how is SCPS addressing students with mental health issues? Well, I think we can never ever have a safety conversation without talking about mental health because we, we have to look at the root cause of what a lot of the problems are. So let me tell you what we have done and what we are doing. My first question, I told you we're all about safety, relationships, and then achievement. Mental health is about relationships. We have to make sure that as adults, as educators, even as students, that every day somebody is looking in every child's eyes, having a conversation with every student, and making sure they're okay. Great teachers, and I see them sitting here in the audience, do that. Because we have to identify changes in behavior. Changes in behavior need to be screened and checked out by a professional. And we have been working on this for several years. You can call it see something, say something. But at the end of the day, it's about a caring person understanding the children that they are dealing with day in and day out and looking for changes in behavior. Just as we have professionals to work with law enforcement, have professionals to work with mental health. For the past four years, this, again, this is not something new. This is not something that we're overreacting to. This is something we have to learn as a county and as a nation. We are working with Dr. Glenn Lambie from UCF where his mental health counselors have been running, I can't even call them pilots anymore. We have three schools that the students work at helping us with students who have been identified by some caring adult that maybe they need some attention. 90% of the times, it's not a mental health issue, but it might be an issue. It might be a hungry child. It might be a child coming from home where the parents had an argument before they left. But we have found cases of mental health issues. And what else we're finding is when a child has a mental health issue, it doesn't stop with the child. We have to work with the family to figure out what's going on in the family and guess what we're finding? Generational mental health issues that really have been ignored. So mental health is, is a big, big piece of what we do. We have a large exceptional student education department that has certified mental health counselors. I have full intentions of bringing to our board and recommending the, the generous funding from the governor and the elected officials to utilize those dollars, number one, to train all of us on how to identify children or even adults that may have some issues and to certainly increase the number of mental health counselors available for all of our students. Because you can talk about hardening campuses, you can talk about all the school safety stuff, but if we don't, as a nation, deal with the root cause of mental health, this will happen again and again and again. And there are ways to figure out what to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Griffin. Our next question is for Representative Plakin. Um, <laughs> oh, hold on. Am I Sorry, oh, this is Captain Francis' okay. question, my bad. Um, <laughs> what is being done to eliminate open campuses and multiple entry points? So, with the exception of the new building, the Millennium, that we're going to open up the new school year, every one of our campuses were not, met, were not built for safety and security. So we've had to drastically look at making them safe. But there is a big balance between a fortress and a safe school. So, you know, a lot of uh, comments that came in about what are you doing, and a lot of it was driven to physical security. 
and I, I'm not sure if I can put an accurate percentage of where physical security falls in this equation, but I guess would be probably around 40%. The, the cameras, access control, uh, assuring that our campuses are more of a closed campus. Um, you know, we have one school, that ha high school, that has a road that goes through it. I mean, obviously that's security 101 that doesn't make any sense. So we are addressing that, sorry, we are addressing that. Um, obviously, it takes time. Some of, some of the projects regarding fencing was started with millage money. My, my staff and I are in a project now to, uh, within five years, to get that completed, depending on infusion from state and federal funds. Um, every school year, before the, the, uh, when the teachers respond, uh, report to school, so does our staff. And one of the things that they do is they use two different mechanisms to go through the school, top to bottom. When I say top to bottom, it's everything from identifying a sidewalk that's raised to uh, a shorting, uh, short fence, or whatever the case may be. All that's sent to our office where we score it and set priorities. Based on our budget, allocated funds in the schools, then we attack those projects. Obviously, fencing is number one. Our fencing strategy is an external fencing and strategic internal fencing to, to help with one single point entry. The biggest challenge is obviously the high schools. Um, again, a lot of kids, a lot of entry points and stuff like that. So we are on a very proactive strategic plan to get that and other things completed within five years. Thank you, sir. Um, our next question is for Representative Flaken. It's been widely reported what the legislature has done regarding safe schools funding. What can we expect in the future? Well, thank you, and thank you uh, again for, uh, for inviting us here tonight. Uh, with the safe schools funding and really the entire bill we passed, it was 105 pages. I have uh, just bullet points of the whole thing here, of all the different elements of it. But we uh, overall, say the safe school portion was 161 million of the 400 million. In a general sense, uh, going forward, I think that uh, this is a wake up call for government at every level. If you look at the Parkland situation, uh, at the local, the state, the federal government, there was failures in virtually every, all the way up and down. So in the legislative process, again, we had three weeks to prepare this bill, and I'm very proud, and so many members uh, worked so hard on it. Uh, we were actually a few days late with the budget because this took so much of our effort and time. Uh, we extended session. There's a couple of things going forward, though, that I think are notable. When you pass legislation, really any legislation, uh, it, we often come back year after year and change things. Uh, we do have uh, a, a panel that we've put forth, a 16-member panel, to in the interim before we're, until we're back next year. It's got 16 members. It's called the uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Public Safety Commission. There's 16 members, uh, three of the parents, the Shack, Mr. Schachter, Mr. Pollock, Mr. Petty, uh, have been some of the visible parents that are on this committee. Uh, the seminal, the uh, sheriff from Pinellas County will be chairing this committee. Uh, we, towards the end of session, last week of session, we issued uh, at least a half a dozen subpoenas to the government agencies down there uh, to get to the truth of what happened. So this commission is empowered for five years to look at both the Parkland situation and other mass casualty events and make recommend recommendations to the legislature. Uh, in the bill we passed this year, I said it was bipartisan. And we hear from people like it, people don't like it. And I heard a long time ago that the best kind of legislation is not everybody loves every part of it, but it reflects a consensus of, in this case, what it would take to keep our children safe. Uh, so I, I see this as a first step for the Florida legislature. And uh, we've listened to voices. Uh, we, again, thousands of people are up there. And I'm looking forward to next year making improvements. And again, with the theme, there's really nothing more important uh, than keeping children safe and making them feel safe uh, as well. So thank you. Thank you. This next question is for Captain Francis again. Um, what physical security measures do we have in our schools? Again, getting back to my previous conversation, physical security is about 40% of my equation. The other side is that mental health bullying. Wow, I didn't know I had that effect. Um, so 
when we talk about physical security, and we've had some, some comments that have come through uh, when we open that link up, um, anything from ballistic, uh, bulletproof glass to uh, uh, ballistic backpacks, blankets, shelter rooms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I assure you, with only one exception, everything that was mentioned we've talked about, either implemented or not implemented due to financial reasons, or table it for a later conversation. The only one that I couldn't do is the, that somebody suggested that the governor's personal uh, security team come handle one of our schools. Um, but when it comes to physical security, obviously fencing is important to us, access control is important to us, uh, camera system, uh, the sheriff mentioned uh, technology, it's not a physical security, but we added that feature. That was one of the biggest things that uh, we brought forward in the school system is to bring technology to our schools. We believe that if you're an employee of our schools, they should be able to lock a school down and activate an emergency. With this technology, it's at their fingertips. They simply push a button and everybody on campus is notified along with executive level of the sheriff's office, schools, uh, emergency management, fire, etc. at their fingertips. Before that call is even dispatched to 911. Secondly, as soon as they activate that emergency, we're automatically grabbing that camera video feed from inside the schools. And I can look, pull it up on a tablet or my dashboard or whatever the case may be and start addressing what the school needs are before we even step foot on there when the school is obviously dealing with the crisis. So as we continue, this currently, we're looking at Airmark from the state, roughly $200,000 coming to Simmel County. That'll cover about two projects for me, fencing project for two schools. So obviously we have to continue to look other places to find the funds to make this stuff happen. I mentioned earlier, we're in the middle of a five year overhaul of our, our cameras and access control, making a single point entry to almost every possible school we can. High school is a little bit more uh, problematic for me, but we are engaged and I, um, there are projects going on that we're not gonna advertise. I can't advertise for obvious reasons. Um, so when I step up here and say, hey, your school's safe today for whatever anonymous threat we got that has no credibility. Uh, I know the sheriff has said it, the superintendent has said it, I've said it. We are very transparent. If we have a problem, we'll tell you we have a problem. We're not opposed to closing the school down till we net that problem out. So we're gonna to continue to keep these schools safe we're going to continue to be cutting edge when it comes to technology and school safety. Um, but again, that's only a certain small percentage of the big equation. Bullying, mental health, et cetera, is a very large portion of that. Thank you, Rick. Our uh, next question is for Board Chair Amy Lockhart. Can parents help fund school safety and security measures? Yes. <laughs> I could just answer with yes, and that could be the shortest answer you've heard all night. Um, but we have, through the Foundation for Seminole County Public Schools, I think it's that microphone. I'm going to stay away from that one. Um, the Foundation for Seminole County Public Schools is Seminole County Public Schools designated 501c3. They are our nonprofit. Um, Captain Francis and his team have worked um, very closely with the foundation to give you all an opportunity. If you are interested, if your heart is leaning toward wanting to make a financial donation. You just heard the $200,000 that the state will give us um, doesn't go very far for hardening our campuses. If you would like to donate through the Foundation for Seminole County Public Schools, you can go to foundationscps.org, click donate, and there is a drop down box where you can select school safety and security. Um, we have had parents ask us, you know, I want to make sure that I can contribute. Um, I want to see fencing up at my kid's school. Well, I'm always happy to be able to tell them that fencing is a project that we have online. It, it's, it's in the capital plan. Um, but if there's something else that you think our schools need to know about, you can certainly designate that. But this effort for us is countywide. Um, when we look at our budget, as Captain Francis mentioned, um, we look at everything that is available to us and we look to the experts to determine what that priority should be. So please know that when you do donate, um, that will go into the general 
plan for Seminole County Public Schools um, in general so that, so that these folks can determine where it, it's most needed uh, most quickly? Um, we have a slide that we're going to show about the Speak Out hotline. We want to touch base on that. We know we've email blasted that out. We have it on our website. Um, that Speak Out hotline number is 800-423-TIPS. That is an anonymous hotline. They also have the P3 Campus app that you can download for iPhone and Android. And then also, obviously, their website, speakouthotline.org. There's obviously materials on your way out that you can pick up as well on the table um, as you leave the auditorium, um, and we encourage you to do so. Um, we do have, Captain Francis, go ahead. One, one last thing we want to mention um, that, you know, in light of that tragic event down south, um, you know, we live in a world of social media. Um, and I've been asked many times, what's your biggest headache? That is my biggest headache. Um, it has a lot of good, but unfortunately, sometimes we see the other side of it. Um, and we're, we're pleading with you, or I'm pleading with you, um, if you have perceived shortcoming on, as far as physical security or in your campus, don't air it on social media for me. Because there's other people, like bad guys, that watch social media. Um, there's, there's a link up here to that school safety and security. That comes directly to me. So if you have questions, comments, or concerns, please just email me. Um, and we'll I, put that uh, email up here for you. Here you go. And I assure you, it is probably... We know about it, and it's in a plan to get addressed. And we share our uh, how the scoring, for example, if it's a project that like uh, uh, fencing or new cameras, the principal knows where they fall uh, in that matrix. And obviously, we have they have a kind of tentative idea when we plan on take tackling that uh, project. But again, we ask that you please do not air that shortcoming or perceived shortcoming via social media. Just please send it to us. I'll be more than happy to respond to you immediately uh, or is this first opportunity I have. Thank you, Captain Francis. Um, to close uh, our evening tonight will be uh, Board Chair Amy Lockhart. And again, I want to remind everyone, we will take all the other questions that we received because like I said, we had over 500 and this was limited to an hour. Um, so we will respond to those. We'll email blast those out to all our families. We'll put it on our website. We'll post it to social media. Um, so we will be doing that. We are recording this uh, uh, meeting this evening as well. So those of your friends and neighbors who weren't able to be here tonight and they're interested in the topic, um, we'll email blast that out tomorrow and put that out there on social media as well. Um, so look for that tomorrow morning okay thank you Thanks. I want to talk to you for a minute as a mom um, because yes I'm, I'm the chairman of the school board and I have this fantastic team of women that I work with um, our school board and we, we wear our school board hats most of the time but there is not a day that goes by that we don't go home and put our mom hats on and so I want you to know um, as parents and as teachers and as community members, that you have a team of people that are working for you, that are caring for your children as though they're our own. I have my own son in Seminole County Public Schools. My daughter graduated from Seminole County Public Schools. And I just think it's important that you know that, that while we as school board members are not school safety security experts, we want the best of the best working to keep our students and our faculty and our staff safe. And, and, and I think Congresswoman Murphy mentioned that as well this morning. Each one of us, or this afternoon, this evening, it's been a long day. Each one of us look at this from a very personal perspective. So please understand that while there are lots of things that we would love to be able to share with you to put your mind at ease, like Captain Francis mentioned, there are some things we just can't talk about. Um, There's some really cool stuff that they're doing. Um, and, and I could tell you, but I know there are at least two people behind me with guns, so I, I can't tell you. Um, but just know that we are on the cutting edge. We are doing some really neat things for your students and our staff. I want you to know that this wouldn't happen without partnerships. Our school board, our superintendent, are absolutely committed that the success of Seminole County Public Schools is dependent on partnerships, partnering with our cities, partnering with our sheriff, partnering with our friends in the legislature and in Congress, partnering with the county commission. This community is dependent and should expect that we work together collaboratively and effectively and that we support one another. Because quite honestly, these aren't our kids in terms of Seminole County Public School kids. 
There are kids. We just have the opportunity to have them for a certain number of hours of the day, and they should be as protected while they're on our campuses as they are when you're in your homes. So please know that we care about them. We care about you. Um, this is a community-wide effort. It's about collaboration, and we would not be where we are if it weren't for those partnerships. I want to thank you all so much. It's absolutely imperative that we continue those partnerships. We are so grateful. And I know that there will be an opportunity to answer some questions after. Um, yes, we'll have our um, SCPS leadership team um, who are with us this evening. They'll remain up here up front. So if any of you out there in the audience have some one-on-one -on -one concerns, some one-on-one -on -one issues that you want to share, um, you'll have the opportunity to do that. And again, obviously that email is a great resource for you as well. Um, please share that with your friends and neighbors. Um, and again, um, thank you for being here this evening. We greatly appreciate your, your help.